Thank you. So yeah, I'm Matt. Thank you for having me here today. I'm the CEO of HLE. Prince of formerly on Transforming Construction, which was a, a large project we ran over the last four years, 2019 to 2000, yeah, 2015, just finishing up now. Uh, and now I have the net zero heat work. And the net zero heat work forms part of quite a large strategy for uh, Innovate UK. We're shifting the way we actually function internally um, to address some of this stuff. So I'm going to whiz you through that. Uh, so you know how we are now sort of realigning ourselves to the to the net zero uh, the net zero domain. So um, uh, you're probably very familiar with um, stuff like this. There's various different ways you can place this information, but it's basically um, a, a, a approximate proportions of how uh, the emissions pan out um, in in the UK. So you've got transport, buildings, industry, and agriculture and land use. So we have pivoted our activity to start looking around these clusters. So now, in terms of the net zero activity for Innovate UK, we focus on heat, excuse me, uh, making use, which is basically stuff, that's manufacturing, and circular economy, that kind of stuff, uh, mobility, uh, and power. So just to be clarified with power, power is power networks. I look at power in buildings, so I look at heat and power in buildings. As soon as it goes into a house, or into a building that's near you, but if you look at the energy network, that's the power piece. And then uh, outside of the kind of the net zero framework, which we have, we have agricultural food, and that sits within our agricultural food system and our healthy living um, area. Okay. So there are now three main areas of Innovate UK. We've got net zero, which are these four at the top, heat, bit, and mobility and power. We've got agriculture and healthy living, and then we've got uh, digital and technology. So those are the three areas that we are now split up. Just think about net zero now, because I'm just going to talk about myself for the next few minutes. Uh, 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 and then I'll go through those heat making these mobility and power piece. So this is how we've now um, split up the uh, the net zero uh, domain within Innovate UK. Um, so a lot of the competitions, a lot of the things that you will potentially have engaged in the past will now fit into this new framework. Externally, it doesn't make any difference to you at all. Uh, but going forward, we will start releasing competitions, start doing competitions based on this framework. So uh, we've got, as I said, the, the, the four uh, horizontals are power, which is basically decarbonized flexible energy systems uh, that allow for heat mobility in industry. Um, so that's the, that's the network piece. Uh, we've got heat, which is all buildings to be completely off gas for heat, uh, for hot water and space heating by 2035. That's my very easy uh, and that's all buildings, so we're not just looking at homes, we're looking at um, everything apart from the really big industrial stuff. So not the really, you know, not the factories and all that kind of stuff, but any kind of other building going up to that. Uh, making use is the circularity, so that's the stuff piece, that's the manufacturing approach, that's the um, whole life approach, recycling, use, um, how people dispose of stuff, whether, um, uh, whether it is reclaimed, whether it is reused or whether it's recycled. Uh, and mobility is looking at uh, how people get around, the sustainability of transport, the individuality of transport, and how personal transport will change in the future. So all of these things are linked together. So I do a lot of power stuff for the heat, because power and buildings. I do a lot of mobility um, piece within the heat, because we're looking at a whole systems approach, how the how heat is charging, and how does that energy network fit into the way people use buildings, or the way people use homes. And then the making use, what materials are we using, what stuff goes into um, buildings, how we can reclaim that, how we can tag it, how we can use building information modeling to understand where things are within the supply chain. So they're not independent of each other. We all cross work with each other. It's all very interesting way of doing things. Uh, and then we have three uh, we have three verticals, which again cross cut all of these things. Um, so I'll start on the first side. Uh, the far side, which is the circular critical material. So this is all the stuff that we have in electronics and gadgets and all that kind of piece. How can we start reclaiming that so we don't have to import it from overseas? And then the net zero living piece as well. Um, I actually think it should be called net zero places, but you know sometimes we're overwhelmed in these things. So net zero living is very much looking at a place-based approach. So we're pivoting again slightly from funding widgets and gadgets and technologies and all that kind of stuff in isolation. We're saying, okay, how does it fit in a place-based approach? How will this actually be applied on a basis of a, uh, 
and a national uh, a national government wanting to achieve something, your regional authority wanting to achieve something, your combined authority wanting to achieve something. So bringing those partnerships together. So that's not to say we're no longer going to be funding technologies. Absolutely, we will be. But we're putting it into a wider context of where next. There are much, we're, much, we're asking those where next questions far more. So just, um, we'll share these slides so it's, it's not a problem, but just to demonstrate where we're looking at from the power point of view, so there's some stats up there. So the power piece is very <coughs> much the big stuff. It's like, you know, where are we going in the electricity networks? We're looking at um, nuclear, carbon capture and storage, the hydrogen economy. Um, so that's where the power, the power team sit in. That's why we've taken power out of, uh, they're not doing the buildings piece, so the buildings piece sits within uh, my heat. So heat in 15 years, as I said, moved completely off gas to space and hot water heating in all buildings. Stats there are fairly, uh, fairly common. Uh, we all know about those kind of stuff, but it's the, the changing of those heating vectors. It's like, how are we going to transition from using fossil fuels and gas or in Northern Ireland, a lot of oil, uh, to um, different heating vectors. Specifically, we're going to be putting an awful lot of stress on the uh, electricity network. How are we dealing with that? How are we going to transition <coughs> in that way? How do, do we understand our building stock and the application of changing that building stock in order to um, increase increase the demands on, uh, on the electricity networks? Can those networks keep pace? We're doing a lot of work in that area. And the way that we're looking at it from the heat point of view is looking at market demand, so standardizing information, making that information accessible, stop, stop working in isolation and stop working in silos, as I said, the green finance piece, and then design engineering. How can we start looking at this from a systems-based approach? So stop doing measure by measure, stop doing building by building, start doing it from a systems-based approach. How do these things work together? How can we deal with portfolios of buildings? How can we deal with archetypes? How can we deal with typologies? Uh, so making news again. This is uh, looking at the circularity of materials. So the, the from the where the materials are coming from, the design, the production, the use, and the recovery of those materials. This is where now the construction piece. So my transformer construction work fits now within the making news area. So we're looking very much as we preach for time and like the best to be here is you know looking at digital approaches, looking at MMC. It's a manufacturing approach. Now. Let's try and shift the shift the market to the manufacturing. Approach. Uh, so there are opportunities, if you're looking in the construction sector, start looking at the make and use area as we start to publicise that. So that's where the, the, the kind of the physical construction is. Just a quick question on that. Does that include uh, the case studies of single economy business models, so feasibility studies of circuitization yeah. and similar models? Yeah. Okay. So it's all, it's all a bit around that. As I mentioned before, these are We'd be very careful not to approach this in a sector basis. So we don't we don't have a building sector. We have a, a manufacturing sector. We inter interrelate all those different areas. So yes, it will it will absolutely apply. And then mobility here as well is um, you know how are we actually going to be getting around? Uh, what is the how's the sustainability? How are the changes in uh, especially now post pandemic? How are the changes of people moving around the country? Okay, so here are the opportunities coming up now. Um, so I realised when I actually um, sent this presentation to, I started on a closed competition, which is somewhat counterintuitive. <laughs> but there is a reason. There is a reason for this. So we've just recently launched an SBRI, which, in case you, it's a, it's not a grant, it's a contract. So the SBRI means Small Business Research Institute, and it's a grant. And sorry, it's a contract. And the SBRI for this one is split up into two phases. There's a feasibility, and that's the feasibility stage, which is just closed. And the aim of the competition is for people to build up data-driven approaches for whole system upgrades of buildings. And what we mean that is using data at the heart, specifying um, fabric upgrades, material upgrades, um, power upgrades, heat interventions, storage, people, is it right, is it equitable, are those solutions correct for the kind of building it's been applied to? Um, uh, is it specifically, are you looking at social housing with vulnerable people in it? So that, in the round, that whole system of what a building does, and uh, and that's that's the feasibility piece. So it has to be that whole system. It's not like, can you check, we've, we've got a solar panel, we want to make it work. It's not that. How it interrelates with that whole system. 
And that whole system can, can get quite complicated. So the reason I'm saying that the opportunity here is not over is because we've got applications coming through for the feasibility that say, yes, I've got a data-driven approach, but I don't have any materials, I don't have a supply chain, I don't have a, a, a building portfolio owner, and that's what the feasibility is for. It's three months feasibility to answer all of those questions, so there's still an opportunity to get in on that, because there are other people who don't have all the answers. If they have all the answers, my question would be like, hmm, okay, you've got all the answers, then why aren't you doing it? That's like a reason for the question. So, if you feel as though you have a role to play within a whole system building upgrade specification package in data, supply chain, materials, a building portfolio, the key piece here as well is the evaluation and monitoring. That's what generally is not happening, which is why retrofit upgrades sometimes are quite challenging because you're reliant on EPC data, EPC data is somewhat rubbish. So the key point here is the evaluation piece. You specify, you install, you evaluate, you feed back into the data model that specifies, installs, evaluates, and feed it back. So you're continuously improving based on the portfolio of builders that you know in the model. My background is in building performance evaluation. I get building performance evaluation for every single thing I do because it's so, so important. I'm not checking at what we're installing. So anyway, if you've got any, uh, any ambitions to get involved in this, we're running it through the Knowledge Transfer Network, but get in touch with Best, Scottish Enterprise, me directly, and then we'll see if we can um, open that up. The competition is closed, but we haven't finished the evaluations yet. So none of we don't know who's floated to the top of the feasibility. We don't know that yet. That will come clear in a, in a Just before you move on from there, will it only be the ones who are successful at feasibility who can apply for the next <coughs> step? Uh, yes. So you yes, have so. to get into a, a, a group with, or an arrangement with somebody who, so, once the awards are awarded. Yeah, so the, when we award in the phase two, it will only be feasibility studies that are successful in this stage uh, that will go be able to apply for phase two. So, but we will know at that stage um, by in a couple of weeks' time, and the feasibility will start the 1st of April. So that's the window of getting engaged from April to June to those activities. And will you be running some specific engagement events for that group, or will they be doing that? We can do, that's a good idea. Let's make it so. <laughs> <laughs> Be honest, I haven't seen that part of it. I know that it's February next week. It's still um, so, the next one we're launching is rapid assessments of uh, building fabric performance. So, I said the BPE building performance evaluation is very core to uh, what I think is important with getting a retrofit market uh, sustainable, understanding what happens and learning from those retrofits. And one of the challenges at the moment is that BPE has historically stayed as a reasonably academic exercise, a very forensic exercise. It's a very valuable exercise, but it takes quite a bit of time, and you know you've done it at a certain time of year, and it's very limiting. What we need to be able to do is get building performance evaluation repeatable and done on a regular basis. So you're not doing end of pipe, you're not building something, testing it, and see if it works. You're testing as you build, so you know it works by the time you finish. That's the point. And so in order to do that, we need to make it quicker and we need to make it more affordable, but keep the accuracy. More affordable, I'm not using cheaper, more affordable. So this will be a, 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 a grant um, scheme which opens next month. For anybody who wants to start looking at um, rapid ways of testing fabric performance, and that could be bringing in um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, it could be using a, uh, uh, an application which is used in a different sector, potentially for looking at air tightness or leakage of other things, bring it in and see if whether it works on a building, building fabric basis. It could be using uh, metering and monitoring to understand that. I'm very careful not to go to the smart meters area here. So this needs to be uh, testing on buildings um, on construction and then on completion. What we are not saying is we want people to be in those buildings. It's that people interaction makes it a little bit different. But this is fabric testing, not ongoing use. Um, or it could be changing, you know, it could be extending the seasonality of testing, it could be ways of being able to extend it rather than it just be sort of, you know, December, January, February, going into March time. If we could extend that, that'd be great. And if we could start doing it on a basis where we're using a 
being able to test under more normalized conditions. So rather than pressurizing a building and doing an air test, but can we do in a way with getting AI and all that kind of stuff involved to be able to do it on a, on a more standardized basis? So you can so you don't have to block everything off and ship everyone out. Uh, yeah, so launching next month, keep an eye on that one. The innovation lab, um, this is this will be launching in April. Uh, this is slightly different for us. Um, again, not a great one for doing the normal stuff, so just why not make my life a little bit more difficult? So the innovation lab is a competition in a week. That's basically what we're going to be doing. So a two-stage um, process. The first stage is all about you as individuals and the organizations you work for. So it's an uh, expression of interest stage where you say, I would like to attend the innovation lab. I have these skills, I'm this brainy, I can do this kind of stuff. And the organization I work for is this kind of organization. We're looking cross sector here. So we're looking at manufacturing, we're looking at robotics, we're looking at um, uh, charities that may deal with, or organizations that maybe deal with the vulnerable. Vulnerability and equitability are very important to the work we're doing at the moment. Um, it could be somebody who uh, has got a portfolio of buildings, it could be somebody who's got a rep from supply chain, could be anybody, don't mind. Anybody across the system that thinks they can start making these things work better. So you would apply to the um, competition, and then if you're successful, we go through an evaluation process, and then we'll take 50, about 50 of the old, 50 people coming through, all from different organizations. We then take them off to a hotel for a week in September, and on the Monday, you'll get into the room, then we work with you throughout the week. We've got mentors and other people there to be able to support. You come together and you start getting ideas around the systemization and industrialization of retrofit across the buildings. And then on Friday, um, we get Dragon's Den without Deborah Reedon. So basically, you're there on Friday, you pitch to us, and we will fund on that Friday. We'll say, this is, this is how you, this is our idea, this is what we want. We already know what your idea is because we've been working with you throughout the week. But then we'll give you a provisional funding on the Friday. You still have to go through the boring innovation funding service piece because there has to be some due diligence. And also, there is a risk that. You know, you may go back to your organization and they say, actually, no, we don't want to do that. So there's a little bit of jiggly pokery that goes on. But it's a closed competition at the end of that. It will open on the Friday. It's a closed competition. So only the people that are at that lab and only those ideas that were pitched on the Friday will get funded. And that's, uh, that week, there's nine million roughly for that pot. So we're looking for maybe three or four projects of size that we can, we can fund through. Um, so that should be quite exciting. I'm just looking forward to the hotel. <laughs> so, uh, so that's all the heat stuff. Those are my three heat <coughs> options. There's a little, there's something else a bit later which I'll come on to. But this is from the net zero living. So I suppose a bit of a tip is when you're looking at the innovation funding service, or if you go on to actually the better one is the um, Innovate UK KTN Opportunities Finder, because that's much broader. That will cover some of the uh, non Innovate UK funded activities. So the, the um, funding final on the, the opportunities final on KTN is slightly better. So this is the Fast Followers. Um, we recently ran uh, a Pioneer Places, which was a big project for local authorities to start really tooling up their um, approaches to mobility, make and use, heat, and power. Uh, those are big, meaty, challenging, big projects. We're very aware that there are other authorities that potentially couldn't do all those four strands of power and heat and all that kind of stuff, but they may need to scale up in a, may need to start focusing on smaller areas. So that's exactly what the Fast Followers is for. It's a similar approach. It will be there to fund an individual within a local authority. So it needs to be local authority led, but it's collaborative. So they need there are people within the, that uh, uh, consortia that can be from the private sector, businesses, RTOs, other research organizations, that the, the project lead needs to be a local authority because it will be uh, funding an individual to work within that local authority on the specific areas from that zero, not, not having to check, tick all those mobility power making use buttons. So it's a, it's a smaller fund of money, but um, 
two years uh, up to 300 pound, uh, 300,000 uh, per place. And that opens, that's open. Yeah, that opened last week and that closes on the 1st of March. Could that one be done on a regional basis? So again, local authorities working together, we find that with a lot of the economic uh, projects at the moment, it is very much approached on a regional basis. So just gonna... Yeah, there still needs to be a I'll lead. Leave, but yeah. 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 So we again we're, we need to work out the terminology because we call it leaders and laggards, and I'm not sure laggards is terribly polite. <laughs> but yeah, we quite often find that you'll have a local authority which has um, got good resources, and then they maybe have another authority that they can work with to start trading. That we love that kind of stuff. We absolutely oh. love it. Yeah. So it's all that's absolutely fine. It's collaborative. There just needs to be one local authority, and who that is. is uh, I'd say we mentioned SMART, you can't have a funding presentation without mentioning the SMART grants. Uh, they are the open competition of Innovate UK, so they're not specific, they're not uh, thematic. Um, they are very competitive, very, very competitive. Um, although net zero is a, is a key desire within you know, a, a SMART portfolio, if you, if you address net zero as a topic, that'd be very good. Um, this is open now, so it opened the other week. Um, it's a rolling fund, so it rolls, uh, that's basically about four a year um, to apply to. As I said, it's very competitive. My, my advice is just don't rush it, is people think, oh, it's open, like, let's bang out an application and all that kind of stuff. It's take your time, build your consortia, because a really, really robust application will, will, will go to the surface. Um, there are people around to help, I can help. I'm not involved in SMART. Completely uh, neutral, so if you need anything, um, I can absolutely help on that. And uh, and yeah, the, so the challenge is if you apply earlier and you're not quite ready, you only have a couple of hits of doing smart, so you can only submit the same application, I think it's twice, or a similar application twice. So if you use one on a half baked idea, you're kind of, you know, it's best to really take your time. So, wrong, it, it opens, it closes, it opens, it closes. Uh, Okay, so this is a little bit of a long shot, but I put it in there because of the, the whole, as I said, the whole manufacturing piece in here. And um, what we really want to see is more manufacturing in construction to come through in some of these um, funding opportunities. So this is made, this is made smarter innovations as part of a, um, the UKI challenge uh, fund. And this is looking at uh, robotics in a factory environment. So it's speaking for late stage, um, innovative digital solutions to overcome some barriers you've got in robotics in a in a factory or a manufacturing environment. Um, much more information on the innovation funding service on this. This is just a uh, a uh, snapshot. But yeah, any kind of work in this area in construction will be well received, very well received. Uh, and yes, it's not all about grants or contracts and stuff. There's the innovation loans, the innovation loans um, round eight has just opened. And so this is uh, a way of, um, uh, it's a rolling fund, so it's all right, so you, you, you pay it back, basically. But this is for very late stage stuff. So it's stuff that we wouldn't necessarily fund through an Innovate UK grant, because it's, it's too commercialized, but it could be used for later stage um, innovations to make it uh, to scale out rather than scale up, so it's making it some of the, I don't know, some of the manufacturing processes uh, leaner to scale out some of your, uh, you know, buy another factory space, get more equipment, you know, change your assembly lines, that kind of stuff. So that's the point of the innovation is to help scale you out um, further than a, than a grant would do. Um, okay, so this is the, so the net zero heat cohort piece is, uh, sits so again within my area. So this is again something we're trying which is slightly different, which is <coughs> organizations that work within the heating building space, there are certain challenges which you don't necessarily need money for an act. So this is not funding, this is support. Uh, and these are the organizations we've got in the cohort, the cohort's been running a couple of months now. And so for example, we, we were at the Energy Systems Catapult in Birmingham at uh, the beginning of this week, Talking to uh, Bayes, um, BRE, Ofgem, Trustmark, uh, who are the other, BSI, and these organizations saying that 
Some of the challenges they have is getting certification to be recognised as SAT. But there's so many barriers, there's so many things to go through. It's not a transparent credit process. What comes <coughs> next? Why do we have to spend so much money just for BRE to put it in a lab and blow it up? Why do you, why does that need to happen? Um, and you know, the cost and the time of getting it done. So how can we remove some of these barriers? These organizations on their own will find it very difficult to address that. If we bring them together with doing a regular game, we can have these structured conversations to say, okay, how can we uh, how can we start to solve some of these barriers and speed up some of this process. So that's what we're doing with the cohort. Very welcome to, again, anyone who thinks that they're, they work in the, in the heat and power in building space. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a technology manufacturer or whether you, uh, you verify stuff or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Get in touch and we'll see if you uh, uh, can, um, uh, can join in with the cohort. Uh, there's we run this in conjunction with sustainable ventures and carbon limiting technologies. So this is again one of the ways that we're working with investors in this area to try and you know, sort out some of the challenges within the within the uh, within the ecosystem. The next cohort meeting or next cohort subject that we're getting together is uh, looking at uh, insurance and how that again can start to help with some of the validation, verification, certification issues, because ultimately a lot of the testing, a lot of the things that have happened is to convince insurers that the product is right. And if we can bring the insurers in the conversation, I think we can cut out some of this deadwood activity that doesn't add value, but will you know will help to speed the process up. So again, if you're interested, uh, let me know. So these are the organisations that we're uh, working with at the moment um, in terms to push the, the net zero activity out. Uh, again, mention Innovate UK, KTN, that is the Knowledge Transfer Network and the in, in Innovate UK Edge. The Innovate UK Edge will help uh, you scale out your, uh, your offerings by giving you um, targeted support. And the Innovate UK KTN is there to help uh, to um, bring other partners and other consortium people together in order to be able to form uh, good propositions and uh, valid projects. So there's a lot going on. I purposely didn't put my email on this, I think. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, there's uh, grab that, that that puts you on uh, a mailing list. So any any information we send out about the heat program, specifically about the heat program, we will. Uh, uh, we'll get on that, but um, again, keep in mind the innovation funding so it all drop me a line. I'm happy to have it. Whistle stop, any questions?